Good afternoon to our viewers in Germany and good morning to our viewers in the United States. I'm Steve Sokol, the president of the American Council on Germany. Thank you for joining us for today's discussion about what we can expect from Germany's new government. We're joined by veteran journalist Stefan Cornelius, who currently serves as the political editor of the Süddeutsche Zeitung in Munich. Um, Stefan, herzlich willkommen. It is great to see you. It's wonderful to see you and um, honored to be a veteran now. <laughs> Well, you've been at it for such a long time, even though um, this position that you're in right now is relatively new. Um, it happened during the pandemic, but after, what, nearly 20 years of serving as the paper's foreign editor. Um, so I think uh, I think it's it's fair to say that you have a lot of experience under your belt. And, and this is true, particularly when it comes to watching what goes on in, in German politics and what for what kind of foreign policy implications um, that has. So I'm I'm absolutely delighted that on a on a busy Friday in the advanced site, uh, you've taken the time to to talk with us as we try to understand um, what's happening in Berlin. Um, so I think it's it's fair to say uh, in German Die neue Regierung nimmt Gestalt an. Um, the, the new government is, is taking form. We're able to read some of the tea leaves um, coming out of the coalition agreement, seeing how the cabinet is being put together, learning a little bit more about some of the key staff. And of course, on Wednesday, Olaf Scholz gave his first Regierungserklärung um, before the, the Bundestag, basically outlining some of the, the government's policy priorities and some of its activities. And I thought we could maybe start our conversation today um, by hearing from you about what stands out um, as, you, as you sort of parse this new government and try to understand the direction that it might go in. Well, I think the, the most important um, uh, thing to observe right now is in the end, how clear a cut that was from the Merkel era. Um, we all thought, well, this is sort of a, a very smooth takeover from the old times to something very similar. But the more this goes on now, the more we look into, um, into this government, the more we do see that the, one of the most distinguished, um, um, uh, or the, the most important parts of, 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 of this distinction is, is basically to be not Merkel. And even though Olaf Scholz is um, extremely similar in how he behaves, how he talks, how cautious he is, uh, we will see a couple of major uh, domestic and foreign policy changes. However, this is Germany in the end, don't expect disruption, don't expect sort of the big bang thing. It's a coalition government after all, it's a it's a, they, they negotiated a kind of a treaty which they want to stick to. Um, but the most important fact is this is a cut to the previous CDU era, actually underlined by today's decision on the new CDU leadership, which we'll talk about later, I guess. And, and um, most importantly, in the fact that those two junior partners in the coalition, the Liberals and the Greens, were more than desperate to get into power, to take over responsibility, and now they want to brand the, polit the policies they, um, they uh, are uh, responsible for. So give them some time to warm up. They need some sort of first week experience in, in the office. But then we'll see a couple of major changes, mostly on climate issues, environmental issues, also tax issues, that's the domestic part, um, social issues, uh, probably even foreign policy. So let's let's unpack that um, a little bit and, and maybe let's start with some of the domestic issues and then and then move on to some of the foreign policy issues. Um, it's it's very interesting to hear you know your initial assessment of, of this new government. I think you know, from, from my standpoint, one of the key uh, observations that, that all of us are well aware of is, is moving from a two-party coalition to a three-party coalition and thinking about Olaf Scholz, who sort of personifies both continuity, having come out of the grand coalition, but also change as he works with the junior partners, is going to have a big challenge 
to kind of keep the government together and keep some of the disparate views um, um, together and make sure that that does not become um, a, a morass for him and for the government. So um, as you look at the, at the constitution of the government um, with these three parties, uh, where do you see some of the sticking points, but also where do you see some of the biggest breaks um, from the conservative-led governments that we've seen over the last 16 years under Angela Merkel? I think one of the biggest breaks will be in finance politics in, in how budget is run and how this government views our debt policy as a tool to achieve its goals. Um, especially the Greens and the Social Democrats are much less prudent in going to the coffers, taking out the money and spending it, trying to first change course, mostly on climate issues, but also setting incentives for uh, consumers let's, to, to, to turn more green to let's buy a, um, an electric car or, or, or just get into other, other kind of, of, of consumer habits. Um, that's quite Amazing because the Liberals, the FDP, and they do run the and they do uh, run the, the finance ministry with their Chairman uh, Lindner. Um, they were extremely prudent in spending money. They were extremely conservative in their approach to fiscal policies. But all of a sudden, seemed to have changed. One of the first moves, and that was the most exciting part until this very day, was Lindner um, introducing um, the additional um, uh, budget for next year in the Bundestag, which has to be voted on. And with a strike of a pen, he basically turned around um, his own beliefs and uh, the fiscal uh, baselines of this country by, um, uh, by uh, turning or by, by shifting money, which was allocated for um, Corona relief uh, into a new fund, which was, which is supposed to turn the economy green. So um, that's fiscally not not uh, prudent. This is not this is not a, a very safe move, and it will be tested in court. Most likely, they will lose it to some extent. But you will do see that this government is extremely willing to to put its brand, put its stamp on things. And um, just after week in office, that was a remarkable uh, thing to do for him. So let's let's um, talk a little bit more about that because one of the the questions I've been asking myself is. Um, how, or, or actually where the fiscal policy will be directed from, um, whether it will be directed from the finance ministry and, and Christian Lindner, who's new in that role and doesn't really have experience running a ministry like the finance ministry, um, or whether this might be something where Olaf Scholz, as the former finance minister, uh, who has lots of experience in this area, might take some control um, in the, the chancellery. So do you see a tension playing out there between the Kanzleramt and the finance mm. ministry over some of these directions? Well, there is no tension as of yet, but that might change. Um, we don't even have those two power centers. There are so many more. Um, and if you talk about three-party coalition, we should also mention that the parliamentary parties of, of those partners are have, have their own kind of lie for themselves. So mm -hmm. especially the Social Democrats are extremely self-confident parliamentary group, a very young one, which not, not necessarily needs to follow Scholz all the way. And we will come to these points over the next months and years where uh, those interests will clash most likely on fiscal issues. And then the interesting point to, your, to watch is how will Scholz behave? Right now, I, um, I suspect that Scholz is... Um, leaving things to his successor in the finance ministry, as long as he does mostly what Schultz would have done anyway. And that's the case for now. So I guess for the first initial months, the, uh, this coalition uh, is in step with what they agreed upon, what they um, negotiated in the coalition treaty. The problems will arise later, um, most likely on, on spending habits, on debt policy, on European fiscal um, uh, issues. 
how much do you spend for joint European budgets? Uh, do you want to have uh, additional European spending uh, programs as we did last year, as we had last year uh, during the Corona uh, pandemic as a kind of a stimulus package? Um, how much of a common debt policy will there be for the European Union? This is where the Liberals and the CDU, uh, sorry, the Social Democrats do divert in their opinion where they are not um, uh, sort of in line yet and where Schultz uh, probably might have to intervene, um, especially on the European level. The next problem is taxes. Um, this whole spending plan they set up now uh, just cries for money. And you wonder where would that come from? Uh, I just mentioned this kind of budgetal, budgetarial trick which um, um, Lindner performed just, just a week ago by allocating sort of old money in a new, in a new pot. Um, this can't work many times, so at one point they have to find new revenue sources um, and either cut other, other budgets or um, get into the debt cycle again. Now the German uh, constitution provides for their, this sort of the constitutional debt break, um, the Schuldenbremse, which um, will be in effect again only in one year's time, so there is a one year left to basically grab the pockets, take what you can get at and carry it away. That's what they plan to do over the year. And it will be a huge outcry in the public, especially from the opposition. And also, I guess, from the liberals, from the FDP, which is not so, so superly convinced that this is the right way to, to run the state ship. Mm -hmm. So this, this supplemental budget um, that, you, that you mentioned of taking money from um, pandemic relief and, and, and COVID relief activities and, and allocating it to um, energy and climate issues. And it's no small sum of money. It's, it's something like 60 billion euro that have been, been allocated as part of this supplemental budget. How has the reaction been in the German public um, to, this, to this news? It seems a little bit like a, a shell game of, of moving money from one place to another, um, having very aspirational um, spending goals to try to address some of the campaign promises and some of the challenges that the new government faces. But as you rightly point out, you know, where is this money going to come from? Well, the money is there, it's allocated in the budget. So yes, you can shift it around, but that's according, that's probably not according to the most simple budget rules that you mm -hmm. basically spend what you allocated for and what Parliament voted for, and not just take it from one pocket and put it to the other pocket. Um, there was no outcry, uh, amazingly enough. There's a lot of benefit of the doubt for this new government in its first weeks. Um, the public is probably a bit tired of this whole political process over the past months. The election campaign was long. Uh, the coalition finding process was long and there's this overlying feeling that well there is change let's give them some some wiggling room let them maneuver let them do some stuff let's see what they do um uh, but, but well the, at, at one point or another uh, courts will intervene and the cdu already um announced that they want to take that to the constitutional court where it will be decided in the end and I guess there will be an outcry. So you pay now or you basically, uh, <laughs> you call for the bill now and you pay later. So, so you, were, you were talking a little bit about the fact that this has been a, a pretty smooth transition um, and that at least now, as of now, um, things are, are working quite well um, between the three parties that, that make up this new uh, traffic light coalition. Um, one of the things that I've been curious about is is when or if we might see some divisions within the parties of some of the, the coalition parties. And I'm thinking specifically about the Social Democrats and the Greens, where we really see a divide between the, the realos, sort of the more realistic uh, centrist uh, thread in each party, and the more progressive uh, fundies on the left wing of both the Social Democrats and the, the Green Party. What, what sort of a role do you think these more progressive groups might play uh, moving forward? Do you think they'll be a spoiler to some of the efforts of the government? Or do you, do you think everybody is really behind trying to make sure that, that this new government is successful, certainly in the, in the early phases? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the disciplinary power of being in government should be underestimated, especially in the early phases. Uh, yes, the, the, the young Turks, sort of in the Social Democrats, especially in the parliamentary party, the leftish part, 
um, they are eager to to make themselves heard and they will realize very soon that there might now be a huge parliamentary group but they don't have that much say they don't have that much influence in government government will be directed from the chancellery so yes there will be their moment when they get up and demand their share um, the same applies to the greens with their parliamentary group but i would also um, point to the potential splits we do see within government uh, positions mostly between Baerbock and uh, Habeck from the, the the green leadership who now run uh, foreign and um, economic ministry but not only that both have a huge um, climate portfolio in their ranks uh, Baerbock got um, a, a major branch from the former uh, um, environmental ministry doing sort of foreign environmental policy. So, so climate and environmental policy is now part of foreign policy. So she will take at least two, two, three, four major divisions from that ministry in her um, um, authority. But the same happened to uh, Habeck, who took the rest of that chunk. Um, he's now in charge of, of um, energy policy and foreign energy policy at Nord Stream Pipeline. Where does Germany get its gas from? What kind of contracts do we negotiate with whatever supplier we find? Um, how about carbon adjustment mechanisms cross borders and these things? This is a major foreign policy portfolio and they will clash over this. The same now on the social democratic side with defense. Um, we do have the new defense minister, Lamprecht. Uh, she's the former uh, justice minister. No defense experience at all. She's trying to get into it, uh, making first steps now. And, I mean, the community is watching it closely. Today, she was visiting the, the Navy and yesterday the Air Force and all that's the, the regular uh, sort of initial moments to get acquainted with the forces. But she's a staunch pacifist, basically. She was... Uh, advocating against drones all the time. Now she's sitting in in the center of that ministry and has basically to to um, pursue interests which she actually didn't follow before. And she might find uh, either allies or new fresh enemies, opponents in her own parliamentary party with the chairman Mützenich, who's becoming even more um, uh, demanding in his pacifist views um, for uh, in, case of uh, in, in, in cases for disarmament or drone armament and mostly nuclear um, power sharing. Um, mm -hmm. that's, that, these are issues where I do see tension coming up already and it'll only take time until we see, until we see them flaring. So it's, I, I did want to ask you next about sort of the, the makeup of the cabinet, and you've, you've started to talk about that as it relates to some of the, the inner tensions that we might see playing out. Um, it was very difficult, I think, on some levels to put this cabinet together because of the desire, obviously, to have party parity between the three governing parties, but also to have gender parity. Um, there was also a lot of discussion about making sure that that voices from the East um, were included uh, in the, the, the cabinet. And I think that there were some surprises. Um, you talked about one of the surprises, uh, Christine Lambrecht, uh, the former justice minister, being named as defense minister. Um, I think there were, were also a number of people who were surprised that, that Cem Özdemir from the Green Party um, was uh, cast as the agricultural minister. Um, and, and there were a number of people who, who were really kind of unknowns um, who ended up making it, their way into the cabinet. What stands out to you about the, the makeup um, of the cabinet uh, beyond you know, your, your observation so far about the defense mm -hmm. ministry, for example? Well, what stands out most is that in the end, it's quite a surprise cabinet. It's not sort of the expected one. The old oppositional structures we saw with all those parties, with the Greens and the FDP, haven't transferred into, into, into uh, the government. And that's due to the strength of, the, of all chairmen in this process and uh, that they uh, uh, made it happen that they got over existing party structures, annoying quite some people. I mean, you mentioned Cem Özdemir, and the guy who lost out is um, uh, Tony Hofreiter, who 
uh, some people might most remember for his haircut, and um, which is a bit like yours, but with more hair on the sides. <laughs> so, <laughs> Tony is Tony is a remarkable guy. I mean, but and he's a quite an, uh, a knowledgeable agricultural type. So he was expecting to get agriculture, but he's from the left wing part of the Green Party, and they simply didn't want to have these guys in the in the in cabinet. There are unreliable, and he was dead and would have definitely been a pain in the neck for all the agricultural lobby groups. So in the end, yes, there's, it's a power cabinet, and they took least. Um, they, they took offense with a couple of existing um, um, uh, uh, sort of power structures, but in the end, I think it was quite surprising. Also in the uh, the, the, the domestic ministry or home affairs is uh, mm -hmm. sort of a regional uh, figure from, from the land of Hessen, but she's an experienced politician. Uh, take the um, uh, construction ministry, housing, uh, a regional politician from Brandenburg. Um, so people you, you haven't seen before. And so we might find that this is a good choice because these are much more experts in their fields. Uh, rather than tacticians and ideologues, so that might be helpful for governing. And and of course, because we're in the midst of the pandemic and and the COVID numbers are are not they, they're stabilizing a little bit in Germany, but they're not getting much better. What about Karl Lauterbach, the the health yeah. minister? I think there was some surprise that he actually ended up being being named health minister. Well, Karl Lauterbach is, uh, is sort of an exceptional figure. He's standing on his own. He um, um, is probably one of the most well-known politicians now in Germany due to his huge presence in the media. I mean, he's a talk show, talk show figurehead. He's basically living in studio somewhere and um, not sure where he's going to sleep, but he's, he has an omnipresent uh, figure in, 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 in all kinds of media. Uh, but on the other side, I mean, he's very eager to, to, to get in the light of the public. But then again, he's also extremely knowledgeable and all the um, um, uh, health experts I know are full of praise for him and his expertise. Now, what we've seen is that both things do clash with him extremely fast. Just in this first week, he managed to basically run the headlines day and night um, and seemed to have even staged a coup by detecting that there was a lack of supply for vaccination for, for vaccines uh, for the next weeks and months to come. So he was crying foul and blaming his predecessor for not stocking enough and not ordering enough. In the end, it turned out as being a bit of a foul play. He made things up just to make him look a little, little bit more as, as the active and uh, proactive um, uh, minister who's now a sort of um, rescuing the German public from the abyss. Uh, this was lunacism and, and Karl Lauterbach has to be extremely careful not to overdrive this. So he might be the very first victim of this cabinet just burning in the, in the, in the fire he's fueling himself. And, and turning to, to the Greens, and we've talked a little bit about these two individuals already in our conversation, but I'd like to, to drill down on it a little bit more. Annalena Babak, the foreign minister, and Robert Habeck, the, the vice chancellor and, and minister for economic affairs, but also for climate. Um, one of the criticisms that I've seen about both of them in the, the German press is that they do not have a lot of experience um, for the roles that they are about to assume. And yet in both ministries, there is uh, an ambitious agenda, um, but they also have ambitious plans. Um, what's, what's your take on how each of them um, will navigate their new roles? Well, you're right. They are not extremely um, experienced in running ministries. However, Habeck was, he was a regional minister in, in Schleswig-Holstein. But um, they're power savvy. They know what they want. The amazing thing to me is, um, I mean, they kept the Greens in, in this amazing flow over two years, three years almost, where they kept sort of peace and quiet within the party. All the conflicts of the left and right wings were solved all of a sudden, smooth happiness, sort of the eternity of um, a sort of, it's, it's a kind of new political uh, uh, narrative for the Greens. Um, and then Annalena Baerbock ran her campaign and honestly, I mean, she disappointed really, really uh, uh, strongly. She 
was running high in the polls half a year before the, the election, uh, before election day at 29, 30%. And all of a sudden she slumped down to 14. And so the Greens are ex ex actually the, a kind of bit of a loser of this election. Mm -hmm. But that blame was never shared and she escaped it. It now only reflects in the way the divided power and the way you see them acting in public, that they basically decided that Harbeck is the stronger of both. Um, and she was basically pleased and, and kept happy with being put to the foreign ministry where she has her sort of her, her, her political base. She, she thinks of herself as being a, an experienced foreign politician. And we talk about it, whether it's true or not, but nevertheless, she brings in some experience and she seems to be now awfully happy in baking in the sun of being foreign minister. And she, uh, in the first day, she really used that immensely. She traveled to all summits. She was at the G7, she was at the European summits. She went to see our most Im important neighbors and she was received with basically huge applause. I mean, uh, Secretary Blinken was full of praise of her when she showed up at the G7 and she makes, seems to make a good impression. However, she has pretty loose tongue and she was paying for that already. Um, when she was commenting on Nord Stream, for example, in a very blunt and direct way and caused the, 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 the energy prices to rise immediately. She didn't say anything wrong, but um, she's basically not attuned to the diplomatic um, uh, attitudes you should, pro should probably show as a foreign minister. So, so sticking with, with foreign policy for ju just a moment, because um, certainly in the run-up to the election, Annalena Babak um, and, and other Greens um, definitely seem to be far more critical um, of China and of Russia than the Merkel government was. Um, and so one of the big questions I think that many people here in the United States have is, is whether this new government will be more hawkish vis-a-vis -vis China and, and Russia than its, its predecessor. But sort of as a, as a corollary to that question, um, during the, the Merkel years, um, a lot of foreign policy was really driven from the chancellery and not necessarily from the foreign office. And so one question is, is whether um, Olaf Scholz will be the one driving German foreign policy or whether Annalena Baerbock will be the person sort of setting the agenda? Well, the Merkel years were sort of gave us various tastes for how foreign policy can, can be conducted from the, from the ministry itself. And so the last foreign minister, Heiko Maas, was quite a, a failure. I mean, he was an, ex an extremely strong minister, but um, Baerbock now um, has a sort of a natural advantage by gaining so much attention by being the first female foreign minister, by, by being so basically refreshingly blunt in what she says. But the big question is in, the effect of what she does. Will it be more words or will it be deeds? Yes, she can be moralistically on the high ground. She can blame Russia for whatever it does. There's plenty of reason and, and the same with China. She got a lot of um, heat from China in reverse already. So even talk has its effect and it might, just be, might have been necessary uh, for a German government to, to be more outspoken on things going wrong in the world. And the question is, how will they actually decide on factual issues? I mean, Nord Stream is the big white elephant out there, and we probably shouldn't expect miracles from that immediately, but there are much more nuanced issues which can be decided upon. Um, NATO just this week decided on um, um, defense weapon procurement to Ukraine again. Um, uh, anti-drone defense. Um, th there is a major, a major conflict coming up with China on the kind of third-party sanctions regarding um, uh, Estonia, uh, sorry, Lithuania, uh, where, where um, German, mostly German, big industries are now in the focus of Chinese retaliatory um, desires. Um, pressing them not to do business with Lithuania anymore if they want to stay in, basically in, in business with China. So these are all issues where she can make a difference. Um, she is still in the process, process of recruiting her uh, immediate advisory 
crew in the ministry, something where Habeck is much more advanced. He knew exactly what he wanted to do and did it within 24 hours. She's still searching. Just today, she made the major announcement that Andreas Michaelis is coming back. He's the former uh, state secretary or, um, for, um, uh, uh, was it, um, uh, what was the minister? Was it uh, Steinmeier or, I think he was he was there during the Steinmeier government as a as yeah. a deputy minister, um, and he's now the, the German yeah, ambassador. But then in he went to London as an ambassador, and he returned now at the age of sixty two and will take over again. He will be the most important operative figure in the foreign ministry, um, and her parliamentary um, ministers, so the, the junior ministers from the parliamentary party, are much less experienced and much less impactful. Um, so she has to find the right advisory board. In the end, the question of um, superiority between chancellery and foreign ministry, well, it'll be decided on, on various aspects. First, what does Scholz want to keep to himself? And right now, I do have the growing feeling that he regards himself as a kind of extremely laid back, quiet um, um, uh, conductor of the whole concert, but not as a major actor. So he might observe much more and leave it to his cabinet ministers to, to be operational. So that would be in her advantage. Um, in the end, foreign policy is located at the chancellery and 80% of the chancellor's job is doing foreign policy. So let him warm up to it and we'll see what happens. Um, but she will definitely attend uh, uh, gain much more attention uh, in the public than her predecessor did. And with, with the right advice, she might do the right things. So I've started to get some questions from some of our viewers, but before I, I fold those into the conversation, I, I do want to ask you about the, the opposition, because as you alluded to, um, just today we got some news um, that Friedrich Merz will be the new head of the, the CDU. So there's, there's now a, a figure um, as the key oppositional leader. Um, and this comes at a time where I think there are no doubts about the fact that the um, CDU has to go through a process of renewal and revitalization. Um, and there were some questions about who would be the right person to do that. Well, now we know who that person will be. Um, and as somebody who, of course, has has followed the Christian Democrats um, very closely over the years, uh, what are your thoughts on on what might happen within the CDU uh, and how it might position itself as a, as the opposition as the main opposition party? Well, exciting issue with the CDU right now. I mean, this this elections or uh, success today of British Mets wasn't a surprise in itself because on just in the first round he already got the two thirds majority which he needed uh, to be elected without a, a second round of voting. Um, so he will uh, be the next party chairman. But that's not necessarily the clear cut to the Merkel era. It is in terms of personality. He's the he's the one man opposition figure to Angela Merkel. He was always running against her since he was losing the leadership battle with her in the late 90s. But then again, it's a kind of jump back to the late 90s because um, uh, Friedrich Metz is a typical product of the of the coal area, the Helmut Kohl area. Um, he isn't sort of the modern type of CDU leader. So the question is, will he just provide a, um, a leadership for a transitional period? and hand over to a younger type then to run for chancellor the next time? Or will he claim for the job himself? We all know Friedrich Metz, he's eager enough to want to have the job. But then again, yes, he has this uh, stigma of being a kind of white old man from the conservative bench. And um, he's definitely not the fresh new CDU face you, you were hoping for. But yeah. then again, he's competitors in that run-up with uh, 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 Helge Braun and um, um, Norbert Röttgen weren't that fresh faces either. So the big message is, yes, the CDU is cutting off the Merkel era. They're trying to find a new new crown. Friedrich Mess is the one who's organizing this. And he's already having this new sound where he's extremely modest and says he wants to bring in new people, young figures, young women. And he actually said today, after he got elected three hours ago, 
this does not not mean that I will run for chancellor. There's no decision on this made. So mm -hmm. we'll see. So he's he's. It sounds as if he's taking a, a fairly humble approach, um, at least initially. And well, uh, it will for be, him, but we'll see. Yeah, it will be it will be very interesting to see to see how that how's that how that plays out. Um, so I have a, a number of questions that that have come in, and and they really kind of go go all over the place, and I, I'm going to try to synthesize some of them. Um, but one of them comes back to some of the, the fiscal issues that you were talking about earlier, but moves them from the national level in Germany to the more um, European level. And um, one of our viewers writes, will this German government herald a more pro-European stance on fiscal issues, i.e. more acceptance of higher European debt levels, um, or will it um, stick to its more um, sort of traditional German fiscal prudence? Well, the, the, the short answer is the former, but does that mean more pro-European? What does European mean? I mean, you do feel, you do have various camps in Europe. Uh, definitely the, the fiscal prudency, the kind of um, um, uh, uh, sort of conservative approach to fiscal policy will be upheld by, let's say, the Dutch government, the, the, the Austrian government, um, the Scandinavians. Um, this is, that, so in, in that respect, the patterns haven't changed in Europe. Um, Schultz might align more with, with um, Macron, but then again, let's wait and see what happens in France next spring. And let's wait and see until uh, Scholz, and basically Scholz knows Macron, um, realizes that most French fiscal proposals are serving the French um, interests and not necessarily broader European uh, interests. So the typical German role of balancing those things, of being in the center of gravity and trying to, to bring all sides in, and by that gaining respect and kind of a leadership role in Europe, uh, that's not really sorted out yet, and that's something Sh uh, Schultz might have to learn, but um, I expect him in the end to be much more on the typical Merkel line of, uh, of, of, of uh, governance uh, rather than to be the, the, new, the, the, the new revolutionary type who sides with Macron. Macron was just presenting his, um, um, his views for the French uh, EU presidency starting January 1st. And he had a sort of a 20 point approach, typical Macron talking for three hours, explaining what he wants to do. And it's simply breathtaking. And it might be, it's very French. And yes, we are um, blessed to have that kind of French president. But then again, this is not really matching the German style of politics and definitely not the Scholz style of politics. Mm -hmm. I think Scholz will be more open to spend money for the European bench if it serves a broader European uh, purpose and it not definitely not, not a national purpose. And, and I think there too it will be interesting to see the dynamic between Olaf Scholz and Christian Lindner when it comes to, to some of this, this spending and some of these decisions. Yeah. Um, th there have been several questions um, about, about Berlin's Russia policy, um, and and specifically about Nord Stream two, and and I guess if if I try to pull a couple of the the questions together, one person is curious as to whether we will see a, a fundamental shift in Berlin's policy toward Russia. Um, I'm sure that that's kind of hard to answer because we don't know what will happen next, but we're definitely seeing a military buildup on the border with Ukraine. And depending on, on how that crisis plays out, um, governments around the world might be forced to, to respond. But you know, what can we expect in terms of, of Russia policy? And, and specifically, um, do you think that the Nord Stream 2 issue um, is, is settled? Um, because of the agreement uh, that was reached by the three parties in the coalition agreement? Um, or do you think that this could be revised um, in the future under the, 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 co the coalition government? Well, let me start with a broader approach, how, how, how this government sees Russia and whether there will be changes, swift changes. Um, Russia definitely is an extremely complicated point for that government. And you do see it in the coalition agreement that they spared this issue wherever they could. 
that one sentence on Nord Stream basically says nothing. And I know it from negotiating, uh, from participants in that negotiations, that those experts who wanted to have clear language, mostly from the Greens, were hugely disappointed not to get it. Does this mean that nothing will change? No, not at all. Um, we saw now in the first days that Scholz was avoiding the hot potato wherever he could. Um, he didn't bash Russia, but he neither sided with it or apologized or sort of um, did what probably the left part of the Social Democrats would expect from him to be much more um, accommodating to Putin. Um, I think he's testing the waters. He's just basically extremely carefully uh, stepping forward. Um, uh, there, we do see and feel the heat already on, on Russian issues. Do, you do have, and I'm not talking from a journalistic point of view or standpoint, you, you basically see, see troll action. You do see how they are increasing the sound where you find all the, um, the narrative, the Russian narrative being extremely loud, transported now in the country in all kinds of media. Um, you do, do see it on the streets where this issue comes up. Um, uh, so Russia really fuels the fire right now, and the public seems to be um, eager to open up again and try to find new middle ground. So that's extremely uh, difficult and dangerous for, for a, um, uh, a new German government. But Scholz is now really confronted with two coalition partners to, who are basically decided. They know what they want, and they mm -hmm. want to be clear on Russia. And the next Green Party chairman, Omid Nuripur, who you all know in Washington because he's a frequent visitor, um, does uh, not hide anywhere that he is decided on how to see this government and Putin. Um, on, on Nord Stream now in specific, um, uh, what happened in the first days is that the, uh, the, the regulatory commission, which has to approve Nord Stream on the German side, the Bundesnetzagentur, um, uh, announced that a decision cannot be expected in the first half year of next year, which means prolonging it even further. Russia was expecting a decision by January, then it was postponed until March. Now we're talking about the second half of 2022. Um, so it'll be dragged out. Why is that? Russia hasn't simply uh, qualified to be approved because the debundling issue of getting the pipeline and getting the gas into different companies and provable different companies, and not simply one, which is um, Gazprom, uh, needs to be fulfilled before the formal um, uh, um, uh, agreement can be made to to uh, to, um, to have this pipeline up and running. The next step is the European Commission, and my basically educated guess is um, the government exactly knows that they will fall over this issue. If they have to make a decision, this will be final for, not for Nord Stream, but for the government. So they want not to take it. And um, the coalition negotiations basically prove that they have avoided that issue entirely. There's just a little sentence and that sentence says, the decision on Nord Stream has to be in line with European regulatory um, uh, affordments. And, that basically means we are shifting that whole issue to Brussels. If one body in Europe is deciding on the pipeline, it won't be the German government, it will be somebody in Brussels. And that can only be the Commission or, and that's the more, even more interesting part, the European Parliament. And there are procedural uh, scenarios where the final decision can actually be pushed up to the level of the European Parliament. And the, the, the move there is pretty clear there will be no approval for Nord Stream in the European Parliament. Just one sort of light, final little remark. Um, one test or contested legal issue is where this whole debundling uh, issue starts to take effect. Does it when the pipeline enters German territorial waters or when it leaves Russians? And that's a legal um, uh, vacuum. It's a legal uh, um, say, sort of an undecided issue, and it has to be decided. The question is who decides it? The German government could make the um, claim to the European Commission and ask for a decision and sort of give advice on how they see it. Then the Commission would be forced to decide it. But there is no action from the German side to get this thing solved. So what it means, if this is being still undersolved when the whole issue reaches Brussels, 
then the Commission has to ask for clarification, but the next level to, for decision is the European Parliament. So there are a couple of um, avenues where things can derail pretty badly. Um, my guess is this government never ever wants to take the political blame for taking the decision or, 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 or deciding against Nord Stream, but they wouldn't be complaining if Brussels would even to the negative and they would pay for it financially. Yeah, so I mean, so it, it sounds like like this is something where we, we will not really see a, a resolution anytime soon, um, particularly because this is a pretty arduous um, administrative approval process by the by the EU at the end of the day, um, if it if it comes to that. Um, so let me maybe maybe start to, to wrap up with with two closing questions um, from from our viewers, one of them. Um, stays in the international arena. And um, one of our, our viewers asks whether with Olaf Scholz in Berlin, Emmanuel Macron in Paris, and Joe Biden in Washington, we can hope um, for a, a renewal of and an improvement of the transatlantic alliance. Um, and I would actually sort of add to that um, whether um, liberal democracies might be in a stronger position um, and, and social democracies with these three in office. Although, as you've pointed out, Macron faces a pretty tough election uh, in the spring of, of next year. Um, so maybe a different way of, of looking at this is how much of a window um, do we have for Olaf Scholz, Emmanuel Macron, and, and Joe Biden um, to make some progress on some of these big challenges that we've been talking about, whether it's Russia or China um, or even the climate issues? Well, there is a window, but only after the French elections, if Macron wins, if his conservative um, um, challenger now wins, um, or actually if she's getting the second round, uh, then it'll be extremely tight and the whole conservative and right-wing camp in France might rally behind her, which is a huge challenge to Macron. Um, but let's assume he wins and that's sort of the, the, the normal part. Then I think we do have a window for uh, real work from uh, the French elections is until end of April, let's say from May onwards, until the midterms. Uh, that's where mm -hmm. the curtain falls in Washington. And um, um, in that period, Germany does leave the G7. Uh, there will be another G7 summit in Elmau in June. Um, so that'll be that'll, that'll be time and and uh, sort of um, the, 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 the stage to to do something substantial. Now, what does to, needs to be done? I think the most pressing issue on the agenda is China. Uh, we don't see eye to eye on China transatlantically. This is a huge, huge strategic um, uh, gap, which will be played to our disadvantage by the Chinese and which will lead to major clashes transatlantically on basically how we assess China. Um, there are good reasons for seeing things differently, but there has never ever been proper talk, not during the Trump presidency, as one can easily imagine, but also during the first year now of Biden's uh, presidency. There's a high level group, um, EU, Washington, talking uh, China. They met two times now. Uh, but I think that's the wrong format. It's basically um, organized with the EU foreign policy body, with uh, the High Commissioner Borrell, who is uh, quite a disappointment in Brussels and shouldn't be the, the, the key point to talk to. So what I do expect is um, those governments taking up speed in talking to each other. And if people will be in place, and even the Biden government, I mean, look at the appointments. We just got the German ambassador um, now having her hearings, I'm not sure whether uh, the Senate voted on her already, but I expect her to be here soon. I mean, she's just ambassador, but nevertheless, even Karen Donfrey took her time and others. So it'll, it really takes time to get the, the machine running again. The same on the Schultz side. However, he does have his advisory body ready to go. Cook is the, the major economic um, and European advisor. He's the former uh, chairman of Goldman. No, not Goldman. Um, was it Goldman? Yeah, he was at Goldman. Yeah. Uh, Goldman Sachs and in Frankfurt. And uh, he's now with Schultz for quite some time as state secretary. He's an extremely perfect partner to talk these things to. 
And the foreign policy advisor will be Jens Blötner, who is now the policy director at, at State in, in Berlin. Mm -hmm. And um, he's also a tough cookie to, to negotiate with or to have, but they, they think politically and they, they wanna have these things solved. So I'm extremely hopeful that we get some language on these issues and it's high time. Um, the German, um, uh, German economic outlook and basically the basic figures of our dealings and dealings with China point to the fact that the independent, interdependence with China is getting stronger and stronger. And if you talk to German industry uh, people um, and uh, figures, um, they do, don't even see sort of a, uh, 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 sort of a kind of a danger for that business. They're not even aware of the of the political uh, um, uh, problems which do arise from this um, uh, from this from this uh, relationship. However, and I mentioned um, uh, Lithuania earlier um, uh, in the call. Um, I mean, the factual things are coming closer and closer, and China is playing hardball with Europe. And I just wonder when BMW is waking up to the fact. They've not just decided to um, to transfer the production plant of the uh, of the uh, X5 from Spartanburg to China. Mm -hmm. uh, the mini, the electric mini, will not be built in uh, the UK anymore. It'll be built in China. The X3 will be built in China. So um, I'm not sure whether BMW is doing itself a service uh, by uh, transferring all its production capabilities to China just because that's closer to the market. Um, they might pay a price for it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, as you and I, as you know, from conversations we've had um, over the past few years, um, I have always hoped that there would be more alignment on China policy between Washington on the one hand and Berlin and Brussels on the other, and, and specifically between Washington and Berlin. Um, and I remain somewhat hopeful that this is an area where the new government in Berlin will find some alignment with Washington. But as you say, um, there are a wide range of views and perspectives in Germany on what sort of a challenge China poses and whether it even poses a, a challenge at all. Um, so that's obviously gonna be something that we will be watching in the, the weeks and, and months to come. But as we, as we wrap up, I'd like to ask you um, about uh, German domestic politics again and, and sort of end where we, where we started out with a question that one of our, our viewers has, has written in, um, which is that, that given that all of the major parties, all of the Volkspartei and all of the catch-all parties um, and the parties in the coalition did pretty poorly um, in many of the Eastern German states, will this government run into issues with portions of the electorate um, that oppose their policies. And the viewer is asking this particularly in light of some of the demonstrations and protests and even death threats that we've seen related to COVID policies um, in, the, in the East. I mean, I'm, I'm really glad you asked the question because we uh, probably would have missed one of the major issues if we wouldn't have talked about it. It's, um, I was actually just writing our papers to our leader for tomorrow's paper on that issue on the on sort of the fear of the democratic uh, uh, sustainability in the east the, the way with the how stable the system basically is and what we saw over the past days and weeks is a bit of threatening it arises from an anti-corona protest um, uh, but it, it basically assembles an electorate which as a mix of huge awareness against the government in general, against the system in general, which is extremely pro-Russian, very anti-democratic, and now finds uh, COVID and the vaccination issue as their um, filter or as their uh, sort of as the escape gate where they, where they ventilate their anger and, mm -hmm. and where they um, make themselves heard. This is gaining speed at a tremendously frightening uh, way. And um, Schultz made a very um, well courageous decision by announcing that he will introduce mandatory, mandatory vaccination um, as, a, as a law, uh, probably in March. Uh, preparations for it are on their way now. It takes time to make it solid, uh, legally proof and solid. 
Um, but nevertheless, it's a political risk, first of all. And the FDP, the coalition partner, in the immediate moment, turned away and said, we'll give that vote free. So it's just, you're not bound by sort of party loyalty in, in parliament if you vote on it. And it'll be a test. It'll be a true test of the coherence of that government and whether the country stands behind Schultz. Um, this kind of rise of tension we do see in the East, but it's spreading, it's all over. It's also in the South, in Bavaria, in the Southwest, in Mannheim, in baden württemberg and other places. This kind of rise is uh, frightening. I'm not um, ringing sort of the doom bells here, but uh, it's kind of a wake up call to the German system that democracy and has to be fought for. And I mean, you do all know that by your own experience in, in the United States over the past months, um, I guess our democratic bodies here in Germany have been extremely, um, not lazy, but so, so self-assured. They were simply uh, uh, not, not being aware of the di those dangers looming there, that they have to stand up and fight for their, for their turf and their claim and their idea of democracy. That's what's happening. And I think it'll be one of the major, major domestic issues, probably shortening the lifespan of that government, shortening the lifespan of a chancellor who has to take much more of a stand than his um, predecessor did. Angela Merkel was the master of ev evading hot issues um, that also increased her political lifespan. And Scholz um, will be tested much earlier. Well, um, Stefan, thank you so much for these insights. I mean, I, I think um, in many senses, we have taken democracy for granted, um, and we're seeing now how democratic institutions and practices are under internal and external threats. Um, and you know, I'm not just saying that because of the summit for democracies that we saw play out last week and the very ambitious goals that were, were outlined by, by the heads of state, um, but because these are issues that we will undoubtedly be struggling with um, in the, the weeks and years to come, both in a very domestic um, sense, but also in, in a, a foreign policy and, and sense and in the international arena. Um, we could undoubtedly spend at least an hour, if not longer, talking just about this topic. And perhaps uh, in, in, in the next year, we can get together again because I don't sadly think that this is going any place quickly, um, but this is going to be a, a key issue to watch. And I, for one, look forward to reading your piece in the paper tomorrow um, because I'd love to, to drill down on some of those insights. Um, but for now, um, Stefan, ein, ein herzlichen Dank. Uh, it is always great to talk to you, and I really, really appreciate your taking the time for this discussion. Um, and I wish you alles Gute and uh, a good holiday season um, and a guten Rutsch. Uh, and I hope that we're able to, to meet again in person early on in the new year. Thanks to you, Steve. Happy holidays to all of you. Thanks for enduring me for such a long time. <laughs> no, this was terrific. Herzlichen Dank, Stefan. Thank you. Bye-bye.